two Hessenberg matrix, so really just whole matrix. And we have A, B, some, uh, actually, and zero. The idea is we've already subtracted out the shift. So, so really think of this is H minus mu identity. Um, so, we want this entry to go to zero. So we're going to try this process of using um, HIN and H22 as a shift and see what happens to epsilon. Okay. So, um, so now we can form a QR factorization. So all we need to do is to form a single Gibbons rotation because it's just a two by two. Um, so our Gibbons rotation is a cosine sine pair. Um, and our cosine is a over the square root of a squared plus epsilon squared, as is epsilon over the square root of a squared plus epsilon squared. Um, so now, uh, so we go ahead and perform this, and then h tilde is going to be our g. Uh, so uh, same old process. Um, so let's write out what this is. Um, so it's going to be G transpose HG. Um, so now we have CS minus SC, AB epsilon 0, C minus S, SC. So we just have to go ahead and carry out that multiplication. And when we do, what we get is A plus B C S B C squared minus epsilon uh, minus B S squared and minus B C S. Now, the key here is what happens to this subtitle entry? Before it was epsilon, what is it now? Well, it's equal to minus B epsilon squared over square root of, actually, that's part of squared, so it's going to be over a squared plus epsilon squared. Okay. Well, keep in mind we're assuming that epsilon is small. Uh, so whatever epsilon was to begin with, now it's squared. So this entry is order epsilon squared. So the consequence of this is If we use this an, an entry and use it as a shift, um, the last subtitle entry goes to zero. Quadratically, um, that is essential for us because the idea is the number of decimal places in uh, this subtitle entry that should be zero. Once we start getting it small at all. It should, the um, number of zero decimal places should roughly double from one iteration to the next. So that means we can, we only need to carry out just a few iterations to make this so tiny that we effectively achieve uh, decoupling. Um, now to use a more um, specific example, um, so let's suppose I just made a random example. So in this case, the 2 1 entry is noticeably smaller than any of the other entries, especially the diagonal ones. It's not that much smaller, it's like less than the order of magnitude smaller. Um, so this entry, what happens to it as we use the same strategy of using the 2 2 element, whatever it is, as a shift, and we keep updating it? So after the first iteration, it actually gets slightly bigger, but then it starts to get a whole lot smaller. Um, uh, and this is just after three iterations. And if I go again, I'm going to have like roughly eight decimal places of zero 
if it's one iteration more, I might as well stop. Um, it's basically round off error at that point. Um, so quadratic convergence is essential because it gives you a rough bound on how many times you'll need to do this to pick off a single eigenvalue. Um, so if we need n eigenvalues, maybe we only need like roughly five n iterations. Uh, whereas um, if this was like linear convergence, that bound would be just yeah, be a lot bigger. <laughs> so um, okay. Well, not a whole lot of time. Okay. Um, so um, but the thing is, we're not done yet. I, I what I should mention. If, this, if we knew we only had real eigenvalues, this would be enough. Uh, in fact, in the symmetric case, um, there's a better shift called the Wilkinson shift. Um, if the, it's one of the eigenvalues of a lower right 2 by 2 block. And that actually, in the symmetric case, leads to qubit convergence. So you're doing hardly iterations at, at all. Uh, so, as far as the symmetric problem is, it's concerned, we're basically done. Um, there's, um, the shifting strategy is quite simple, it's, it's practical. But we're talking about the unsymmetric case. We are definitely not done. Um, so using this strategy of taking the n n element as your shift is called the single shift strategy. Um, but this strategy is not very effective if the eigenvalues you're trying to get, so like the largest eigenvalues you haven't already found, are complex. Because in that case, HNN is probably not a good approximation of an eigenvalue. You're not going to get any convergence. Um, so, here is the alternative, a double shift strategy. Uh, what you do in this case is um, you use two shifts, mu1 and mu2, and we let those be the eigenvalues of the Lower right two by two block. So H and N, H N minus one, H N, H N, N minus one. Now a two by two block is no problem getting the eigenvalues there. You're just using a quadratic formula. Um, okay. Um, so you compute those two eigenvalues, and then you do the following. You let H minus the first shift, and you go ahead and QR factorize that. And then, like before, you multiply the factors in reverse order, and you add the shift back. Then, you use the second shift on H1. So you subtract that out, and QR factorize that. And then to get your updated Hessenberg matrix, you do the same thing. Multiply in reverse order, add the shift back. Okay, so, um, so this works perfectly fine. Um, that uh, even if you have a case of complex eigenvalues, whatever you get from here will be decent approximations. So you might think, okay, now we're done. We have a good way of speeding up convergence. But there's one significant hurdle is that even if a matrix H is real, that uh, this algorithm as written relies on complex arithmetic. Now you might think, well, who cares? Well, you have to care because I said so. <laughs> no, because of speed. Um, first of all, uh, and also store space. If you're storing complex numbers, 
you, um, you're using twice as much storage because you have a real part and the imaginary part. Second, arithmetic. Um, addition and subtraction will take twice as long. Um, also, um, uh, multiplication, you can optimize it to have it take uh, three times as long. Um, and uh, similar, actually, it's a somewhat greater cost for uh, division. Um, so this really increases your overhead. And you're, you're, you're trying to reduce the number of operations, but now you just heaped a whole bunch more on yourself. Um, so if a matrix is real, what we like to do is keep it with real arithmetic all the way to the very end until we have its quasi upper triangular form, and we might have some two by two diagonal blocks. And then you're still doing real arithmetic to extract the actual real imaginary parts of the eigenvalues. Um, so it's um, this, so this really is significant. We want to try to avoid um, doing any complex arithmetic. Okay. And I think I'm have just enough time to uh, heap on one more dilemma. So we're, we're going to try something here to um, get around this. And I will show you why it fails, and then we'll be out of time. <laughs>